When it comes to burn management for occupational therapy, it depends on the stage of recovery. Emergent, which is 0 to 72 hours after burn. Acute, which is about 72 hours after the injury. And then the much later rehabilitation stages. OT involvement includes the evaluation and intervention. OTs evaluate the client holistically, but more specifically for burns, they consider the burn characteristics such as location, size, depth, and mechanism of burn, as well as, you know, intuitive components of ones you're probably familiar with already. MMT, range of motion, pain, sensitivity, and so on. OTs in the emergent phase provide interventions mainly, but not limited to interventions of splinting. I'll mention splinting here in the emergent phase, but it really carries on into the later phases of recovery as needed by the patient and the extent of the recovery and other characteristics such as contractures and pain. There are also different splinting types, not just static, but also progressive and dynamic, but that's beyond the scope of this review video. More specifically, splinting for burns is often in anti-contracture or anti-deformity position. For the neck, it tends to go into flexion, so we want to split in neutral to slight extension. For the chest and abdomen, it is often in a forward flex posture, so we want to split in trunk extension and the shoulders retracted. For the shoulders or the axilla adducted, so we want abduction to about 90 degrees and external rotation away from this hunched, contracted position. You may have heard of the term airplane splint, and that's what I think of in terms of how it visually looks. Elbows tend to go into flexion, so we want to split into more of an extension. Forearms can be splinted in neutral to supinated. And for the hands, it, the key is to think of it in terms of the intrinsic plus position. And it's characterized by flexion at the MCP and extension at the IP joints. Thumb is abducted and extended, and the wrist is neutral to slight 30 degree extension. In terms of the lower extremity, the hips are slightly abducted to about 10 to 15 degrees and in neutral extension. The knees are splinted actually depending on how the burn, where it presents in the opposite direction of where the burn location is. So if there is an anterior burn, you split into slight flexion, knee flexion, and with a posterior burn into knee extension, which makes sense because you kind of think of the body wanting to go towards that same direction of the burn. So the goal is to counter it with the opposite into anti-deformity or anti contracture position. Last, the ankles can be in neutral or slight dorsiflexion. Other more specific types of splinting techniques include anti-frog and anti-foot drop splits. Holistically for splinting, a comprehensive approach includes educating staff, patients, caregivers about the reason for the splint after burn, the splint wearing schedule, regular checking for a proper fit, and the skin as well, as well as re-evaluating regularly throughout later stages of recovery. An example of a splint wearing schedule is say two hours on and then two hours off alternating. When designing and fabricating splints, be sure to avoid pressure over bony prominences as well as being compatible with the burn team's interventions such as dressing and topical medications. Try to favor and find the balance between splinting for function and meeting functional goals, just like my t-shirt. Even if it is very early in the recovery phase and the patient may not be doing much in terms of occupational participation or even activities out of bed. Other education and collaboration with the burn team includes early positioning and finding the balance between comfort versus anti-contractures, nutrition, hydration, pain management, and psychosocial, which is very big with this population. Always respect pain, even if not doing exercises instead of having patients work through it especially when it comes to burns. Pain management techniques. These include music therapy, guided imagery, biofeedback, progressive muscle relaxation, even using distractions such as video games, apps, and VR or virtual reality. OTs should also work with nursing to address skin, moisture, and conditioning. Itching, which is sometimes referred to as puritis, with topical treatments, compression garments, and massage techniques. Let's talk about the acute phase now. The themes for intervention in the acute phase include continued splinting as before and adjusting as necessary, but also positioning, edema management, ADL participation. And you can remember this for the acute phase of the burn, like how in acute care, we often work with ADLs. Edema management includes elevation and also addressing range of motion 
and compression with wrapping with dressings and custom or off-the-shelf garments. We continue client and caregiver education about the importance of independence in activities and participating in exercises despite psychosocial factors or even physical factors such as pain. So pain management in order to participate in therapy. And OTs can be a big help in this department offering pain management strategies. If a patient had surgery, then immobilization may be required for several days before activities such as walking, especially if there's, say, a lower extremity skin graft. One contraindication to remember is not to range immediately after a skin graft. Range of motion should start with gentle range of motion when cleared, and that's about three days for a mesh graft and five days for a sheet graft. The rehabilitative or rehabilitation phase builds on previous interventions with more of a focus on skin conditioning and scar management. Skin conditioning includes skin lubrication, skin massage, desensitization, and the use of sun protection products, whether creams or garments. Just so you know, the pathophysiology of hypertrophic scarring is from the collagen arranging itself in more of a random, undesired fashion compared to the normal laid out pattern on the skin. So to counteract this, pressure may help to reduce collagen production by limiting what it needs, which is the supply of oxygen, blood, and nutrients in the scar tissue. The application then of pressure garments helps to alleviate itching and pain and is introduced as soon as the patient can tolerate pressure being applied. Compression helps to prevent raised scarring if applied early enough. Scar management includes compression therapies with various products such as isotoner gloves and even silicone, which is often used with wound care for burns and scar management. Custom garments and a good wearing schedule for it, as well as patient compliance are important for managing edema and scars. Research suggests that a pressure of at least 15, some say even 20 or more millimeters of mercury to help accelerate scar maturation, which can then be gradually decreased in terms of pressure later months. Exercise that addresses strength, flexibility, range of motion, endurance, and balance are important to help promote functioning and to help also reduce with pain. Aerobic exercise should be incorporated into activities as early as can be tolerated. Studies have shown that progressively graded exercise are important to regain strength and activity tolerance. Resistive exercises have also been shown to challenge cardiopulmonary system to contribute to faster recovery and increased functional independence. In preparation for discharge, it is important to address the holistic components of exercise in terms of resistance, endurance for multiple systems such as the cardiopulmonary system as mentioned before, as the research says that this is often an under-addressed area. The outpatient and community integration phase after discharge continues after the therapies are from, say, the hospital, and the added focus is including scar management that is independent from the healthcare team, like so patients do it themselves, also mental health, as there may be depression, PTSD, stress, anxiety, body image issues, and loss of occupational participation. Strategies include pain management and stress management as well to help patients adjust into the community and find their meaningful occupations. Some barriers to address for living in the community may include pain, heat intolerance, hypersensitivity, sunburns, scar formation, and itching. While the earlier focus with OTs was in, say, ADLs, it is also important to address other meaningful occupations with considerations for the population and the patient individually, such as the age, such as a younger burn victim going back to school, or even the parents and caregiver who may be guilty and responsible for the initial burn injury. Return to work may be important, say for adults, or if it was like an adolescent, it may be social participation for this population. And there's a variety of factors, and the key is to be holistic in terms of the focus for burns individual to the patient in their needs. And much of the review materials that I found for the NBCOT take a bottom-up approach, but just in general, in terms of outcome measures you may use, a good one is the COPM. And in terms of rehab, you may see things like the FIM or care tool being used. Theoretically, a good one to use may be the occupational adaptation model, which can be useful for burn populations as it is a holistic approach and focuses on enhancing the individual's ability to adapt to occupational challenges in their life. Other theoretical frameworks, including psychosocial ones, can be helpful to use in conjunction with physical rehabilitative techniques. 